I don't care how long it's been live in your life. I don't care how you justified what you did. Now that God is confronting you in his word, he says you got to have an execution. You got to march some practices out to the yard and shoot them down. Sometimes the best way to win a gunfight is to bring a sword. Hello and thanks for being with us for today's Destined for Victory with Pastor Paul Shepard. When Satan tempts you, he's not afraid to bring out the big guns. And when he does, your best weapon is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. Coming your way next, we continue looking at the life of Joseph, a young man whose faith had already been severely tested. But he was about to go through his toughest test yet, one that all of us have faced at one time or another. Stay with us now or stop by our brand new website, PastorPaul.net, to listen anytime on demand. That's PastorPaul.net. Now, here is Pastor Paul Shepherd with today's Destined for Victory message, Do the Right Thing. Thing. Now in the last message in the series, we looked at the fact that God's plan for our lives is about the journey as well as the destination. And we were looking at the fact that in the early verses of Genesis 39, you see Joseph having to learn how to live life on a different level. For he is no longer the favorite spoiled son of his father in Canaan. He's now a lowly slave in Egypt. And he's got to learn some things at this season and in this stage of his life as a young man called according to God's purpose. He's got a lot of growing to do. He's got a lot of learning to do. He's got a lot of developing to do. And this speaks to all of us because all of us are on a journey and God's will is about the journey as well as the destination. We saw Joseph increasing in wisdom. We talked about the fact that he had to develop a strong work ethic. He's no longer spoiled in his father's house. He's now got to develop a work ethic. And God blessed him to do that so well that God gave him favor with his master, Potiphar. And he went from being a lowly slave in Potiphar's house to promotion to the head servant in the house. And God blessed him to develop that work ethic. And so we saw that he grew in his relationship with God. He had to develop one for himself. He couldn't trust his parents' walk with God. He had to develop one for himself. And we said those things speak to us because all of us are on a journey with God. And this is a season in your life and mine where there's a lot of growing and developing that needs to take place. Now when we come to this passage... We see Joseph facing a challenge that comes to him in the form of his master's wife. I call her Mrs. Potiphar simply because we don't know her first name. So Mrs. Potiphar now represents a new challenge in Joseph's life. God is blessing him. God has given him favor in Potiphar's house. And if you've ever had favor, you know it's a wonderful thing when God gives you favor because favor isn't even fair. And God blessed him in such wonderful ways. But the bottom line is, Mrs. Potiphar set her sights upon him and wanted to have an illicit relationship with him. And what we see in this passage is that Joseph refuses her. So we want to examine this whole issue of what he was asked to do and what the refusal of it was all about. So we have to talk here about the matter of sexual immorality to learn this component from the life of Joseph. Now I realize that as we deal with this matter of sexual immorality, I need to deal with the fact that there is much ignorance, there is much revisionism, And there is much presumption with regard to this matter in the body of Christ. There is, first of all, ignorance. There are many of you who don't know that in the will of God, there is right and wrong with regard to sexual expression. And so we need to stop and talk about it. These are not the days where everybody was raised in church and everybody lives among people who have a moral consensus. Some things are right and other things are wrong. We live in a day where people think it's up for grabs. What's right for you isn't necessarily right for me is kind of the mantra of many people's lives. But when you come to the word of God, you discover that we serve a God 
who has a moral standard for our lives. That is not up for debate. And he says, this is the way, walk in it. And so for those who have been ignorant of that teaching, here comes the word of God to simply inform us to say, this is God's plan for your life in this area. If you haven't known it before, here is the word of God that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. There are others who have experienced revisionist theology. That's the theology of those who will tell you that, well, it doesn't really mean that. And then there are those who have practiced presumption, the whole idea that, well, God understands my situation. And so what the Bible says about sexual morality does not apply to me because God and I have an understanding. So we have to do some work in the scriptures. And in this message, I want us to all have some time of personal reflection. I hope that we will all reach a personal resolve to live God's way in this area. And then for some of us, this is a call to personal repentance. Because you can't get on the right track until you repent and understand the way I'm living is not supported by the word of God, and I must change. So let's do a little investigation in the word of God and see what the word has to teach about sexual immorality. I'll just take some time and walk through key scriptures. There's so much the Bible says, but in the interest of time, I'll just cover some key scriptures on the matter of sexual immorality. Now, when you see the term, if you read the New International Version that I often speak from, you will see the term sexual immorality from time to time. If you have King James, you will see the term fornication. And fornication is a term not typically used in our day, so a lot of people are confused by it. And then when they go over to another translation such as NIV and see sexual immorality, the question comes to their mind, okay, but what is immoral in terms of sexuality? Well, let me help you understand the word that is translated fornication in King James and sexual immorality in NIV is the Greek word porneia. Pornea. You can tell by the root of the word that we get several English words from that. And it speaks to the matter of, of sexuality. This word porneia is a general word in Greek that covers all sexual expression, all sexual relationship outside of marriage as defined in scripture. Now, Marriage even is up for grabs in our day because once you throw away the moral consensus, once you throw away your compass, you don't know which way north is. And once we decided in our society the Bible was not going to be the basis for our moral decision making and what was right and wrong, then everything gets up to grabs. So it's really not surprising that society now is saying, well, marriage doesn't have to be what marriage always has been. And we are now redefining marriage as a society. Let me tell you something. We can't redefine marriage and be in the will of God. You know why? Because we didn't define marriage. You can't redefine what you didn't define. (laughs) Marriage was God's creation. It was God's institution. When you read in Genesis chapter 2, you see what God had in mind. And he is the one who determined what marriage was to be. And he has a specific plan for that. It is to be a monogamous, committed marriage between one man and one woman. That's the biblical definition of marriage. Society can say we got a broader definition or a different one. But guess what? Society is wrong and God is right. So, the word... Pornea, translated sexual immorality or fornication, is a word that covers all sexual relationship outside of that biblical definition of marriage. And let me just walk you through several scriptures where you find this term. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 18, Paul says, flee from sexual immorality. There's the term. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with 
your body. That's God's word through the apostle Paul to say we must flee it because it is not God's will. So we must flee. We must run away from sexual immorality. And this is God's plan for his people. And we'll be right back with more of today's Destined for Victory message from Pastor Paul Shepard, Senior Pastor at Destiny Christian Fellowship in Fremont, California. If you enjoy listening to Pastor Paul, we know you'll love watching some of his best video clips by subscribing to him on YouTube. For more details on all of Pastor Paul's social media, scroll to the bottom of the homepage at our brand new website. And that address is the same as always, PastorPaul.net. There you can always listen on demand to recent messages and find a variety of new features and resources. That's PastorPaul.net. Well, God calls us to a standard of living, not to earn our salvation, but because we already have it. With the rest of today's Destined for Victory message, Do the Right Thing, here again is Pastor Paul. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 19, the same passage where we, a few verses down, see the fruit of the Spirit. That passage is preceded by this verse, which says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. And the first thing he mentions is sexual immorality. And he mentions a lot of other things so that you are convinced that the word of God, when it talks about sin, isn't fixated on a few external things such as sexual immorality. He talks in that list about idolatry and witchcraft, about hatred, about discord, about jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, and on and on. And then he says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. What is Paul saying? He is saying God has a standard for our lives. He calls us up to that standard. And he says, I want you now to live according to the light I've given you in my word. And if you persist in disobedience to my word, it is proof that you are not a true citizen of my kingdom because you refuse to live under my lordship. So it's very practical teaching. Paul says that these things, I'm warning you that they must leave your life because they are not part of God's will and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that flies in the face of revisionist theology because revisionist theology says nothing will ever cause you to not be a citizen of the kingdom of God. But the word of God says, no, if you keep living this way without repentance and change, you are not a citizen of God's kingdom. By the way, I knew that this message would be one where I'd be saying my own amens and encouraging myself. So I don't want anybody to feel bad for me. I understand sometimes we got to grapple with some rough things in the word in order for us to get right. Sometimes the word is tight, but it's right. (laughs) Tight, but it's right. So don't feel bad. I know the territory I'm treading in. I know that this might not be the message you just want to be the first person in the CD line for. (laughs) But we have to grapple with some things because God is calling his church to get right in these last days. He's calling for us to do that. So we've got to grapple with it. Let's go on to the next passage, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 3. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. I told you it's not just about your body. Or of greed. He says, because these are improper for God's holy people. See, the Bible is practical. Paul says here to the church at Ephesus, some things are improper for a child of God. Yes, you're saved by grace through faith. Yes, Jesus has come into your life, but some things he calls you away from. He says, because they are improper for us as God's holy people. And then again, later in that passage, he talks about the fact that People who persist in this kind of lifestyle, immoral, impure, or greedy, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Colossians chapter 3. You say, oh, when are you going to be done with these verses? (laughs) Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And the first thing in the list is sexual immorality. Now notice what Paul says to the church at Colossae. It's very practical. The word of God is practical. He says to all of us, 
Put it to death. I don't care how long it's been live in your life. I don't care how you justified what you did. Now that God is confronting you in his word, he says you got to have an execution. You got to march some practices out to the yard and shoot them down. You got to have an execution. He says, put it to death because it's part of your earthly nature, not a part of you walking in the spirit and walking according to the will and the plan of God. And so the word is just very practical. He says, you put it to death. Don't ask God to just zap you with so much supernatural power until you couldn't sin if you wanted to. That's praying amiss. It's not going to happen. You are not going to have such an experience with the Holy Spirit that you say, oh, my goodness, I'm just, I can't even sin. That'll never happen. (laughs) Doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Walking with God for 60 years. You can sin today if you don't put some things to death. So the word is very practical. Put to death, Paul says, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, including sexual immorality. And in verse 6 of Colossians 3, he says, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. What we have to understand is that it matters to God when his people live in sin. It matters to God. See, there's a type of revisionist theology afloat that says, you know, these things really aren't a big deal because God loves us like we are. He does love us like we are, but he loves us too much to leave us like we are. So he calls us up to a holy standard. And he says some things have to be put to death. And he says because of them, the wrath of God is coming. So we want to get right before the wrath of God shows up. One more, one more, just one more. Hang on in there. First Thessalonians chapter four, beginning with verse three. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Now pause right there. A lot of people aren't sure. Well, that's not a familiar word, sanctified. What's God's will have to do with sanctified? What is that word? Well, you probably know more about sanctification than you know. You just haven't connected to dots. If you grew up in a house like many of us did, where your mother had some special dishes, cups, saucers in a particular closet, typically called a china closet or that sort of thing, because those dishes were China, you know about sanctified. (laughs) Those dishes were sanctified. Now you know what it means. The word sanctified means cleansed and set apart for specific use. It means it's not ordinary. It means you don't run home from school and you want to make a bologna sandwich. And you grab a dish out of your mama's china closet. That didn't happen. Because those things were cleansed and set apart for specific use. For God's use. So, it is God's will, Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, that you should be sanctified. That you should be cleansed. That your lifestyle ought to get cleaned up. And that we are set apart so that we're uncommon. We're not ordinary. We're not just in any old closet. We don't live like other people. This is God's will, he says. My people ought to live differently because they have a different standard. So he says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Next phrase, that you should avoid sexual immorality. That each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. See, again, Paul is giving us very practical guidelines from the word of God. He says, God wants us to learn how to put some things to death, he said in the other passage. And here he calls it learning how to control your body so that you can bring it into conformity to the will of God. Now, these are just several passages I could have gone on and on and on. You're glad I'm not. But I've already made the case. The Bible is clear. God has a standard for our lives with regard to sexual relations. So, knowing that the ignorance now is taken away, we have the light of the word of God. Now, there are some who have been exposed to revisionist theology. Revisionist theology is preached by people who want to bring the word of God down to where we are rather than bring us up to where it is. 
And you have to be careful what voices you let speak into your life. Because if you listen to people who will cause you to bring your life down outside of God's will, they're not helping you. If you listen to these spiritual magicians, they're all over the talk shows. They write books and they have newfangled philosophies. And it's interesting that all of them say you can live any old kind of way and be right with God. But when you get to the pages of the word of God, which has been eternally inspired, what you will find is that what they're preaching is not according to truth. You'll find these people saying things like, well, you know, since God's grace, since God's love is upon all of us, then really what you do, it doesn't matter because God loves you just like you are. And so it doesn't matter. That's not according to the word of God. That's being a spiritual magician. Let me help you understand something. When you find a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat, there's a specific reason. I'm about to tell you why a magician can pull a rabbit out of a hat. If you don't really want to hear this, you came to the wrong service. (laughs) If I'm messing up your understanding of magic tricks, I'm sorry. I need to say this to make the point. So I'm about to tell you why a magician pulls a rabbit out of a hat. Listen carefully. (laughs) Because he put the rabbit in the hat. It's not deeper than that. (laughs) Through sleight of hand, through craftiness, through deceit, making you think that magic happened when it's just sleight of hand. Thanks so much for being here for today's Destined for Victory message, Do the Right Thing. And I'm pleased to welcome back Pastor Paul to the microphone who joins me. Pastor We often hear from people who've been blessed by the ministry, and every time I hear one of those testimonies, I feel blessed and humbled that I get to play a small part of that. Talk about the importance of encouragement and the role it plays in all of our lives. Often when we have our worship services and I have people pray, we usually link hands so that they're praying for the person to the left and the right. And as I end the prayer from a pastoral standpoint, I say to people, I want you to know that when you pray for your neighbor, you're inspired because when he answers your neighbor's prayer, he's in the neighborhood and he's going to bless you. And so we need to be encouraged that as we minister to other people, God is going to see to it that our needs are met. So encouragement is important to give and to receive. Well, we are always looking for new testimonies to share with our listeners. If you came to faith in Christ through the Destined for Victory broadcast, if Pastor Paul helped you through a difficult circumstance, if you've been blessed in any way by his messages on Destined for Victory, we'd love to hear from you. From the PastorPaul.net homepage, click on Contact Us and tell us your story. Again, that web address is PastorPaul.net. Also keep in mind that for your generous donation today, we'll send you by request a thank you gift of our own, the InterVarsity Press Study Guide, Joseph, How God Builds Character. If you're like most people, your favorite part of a fairy tale is the happily ever after. But even in fairy tales, just like in real life, happiness often comes to us on the back end of adversity. In this resource, you'll take an in-depth look into the story of Joseph as a means to helping you see that God's plans for you will always be fulfilled. That's Joseph, How God Builds Character, yours by request for your generous gift to Destined for Victory. Do that by calling 855-339-5500 or visit PastorPaul.net to make a safe and secure donation online. And of course, you can also mail your gift to Destined for Victory, Post Office Box 1767, Fremont, California, 94538. He knows God has given him a dream And he knows he didn't see Mrs. Potiphar in the dream. So he's got a decision to make. How did he make that decision? He did it the same way you and I are going to have to do it. And that's tomorrow in Pastor Paul Shepard's message, Do the Right Thing. Until then, remember, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. In Christ, you are destined for victory.